I'd like to welcome everyone to our Sunday morning message. Uh, we've been in a series on fear, and there are many today who are beginning to fear loss of their freedoms. Uh, the freedoms that men and women in the armed forces have died for. Today's message speaks to the meaning of Memorial Day. Now, before we get to the message, let's go to our Lord in prayer. Our Lord, it's so comforting to know that you are sovereign. You're the one who is in control of everything, everything that goes on in our lives and around the world. Because to us, much in the world seems to be upside down. But Lord, it's reassuring to know that you are working all things together for good, for those who love you, for all of us who are true believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, in your perfect love for us, as your children, I lift up the concerns of those in our congregation. For those who are weary, your strength and your comfort, your strength to those who are currently weak and sick. And Lord, we pray that our country be back to normal really soon. And Lord, we continue to pray for all those who are in authority over us, beginning with President Trump, your wisdom and strength to lead our nation and protect our freedoms. We pray for Governor Murphy that he would govern according to your truth and wisdom with the protection of our rights and our freedoms. And Lord, we pray for revival in our country. And now, Lord, we pray that you would use this message for good. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Tomorrow, we celebrate Memorial Day. Uh, Memorial Day is observed on the last Monday of May. And it was formerly known as Decorations Day. And it commemorates all men and women who have died in military service, in service to our country. Veterans Day is distinct from Memorial Day. You see, Veterans Day celebrates the service of all men and women who have uh, served in the military, those military veterans, uh, while Memorial Day honors those who have died while in military service. Now, certainly we celebrate uh, the service of all men and women who have served in the armed forces, uh, but there's a, even a greater debt that's owed to those who gave their life in service to our country. So let me ask a fundamental question, and I'm gonna phrase it in different ways. And it's this, why did they die? For what were they fighting? What was so valuable that it paid for them to even sacrifice their own life? Well, let's look at some of our national hymns. America, also known as My Country Tis of Thee, it's an American patriotic song, the lyrics of which were written by Samuel Francis Smith. And the song served as one of the uh, de facto national hymns of the United States before the adoption of the Star Spangled Banner as the official U.S. national anthem in 1931. Samuel Francis Smith wrote the lyrics to America in 1931 while a student at Andover Theological Seminary. The first publication of America was in 1832. Verse 1 of the song America says, My country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside, let freedom ring. Verse 4, our father's God to thee, author of liberty, to thee we sing. Long may our land be bright with freedom's holy light. Protect us by thy might, great God, our King. What land do we live in? Sweet land of liberty. What should ring from every mountainside? Let freedom ring. Who's the author of liberty? Our Father's God. Long may our land be bright with what? With freedom's holy light. Our freedoms come from God. Who protects us? Protect us by thy might, great God, our King. How about the Star Spangled Banner, our national anthem since 1931? In verse 1, sending is, O oh, say, does that star-spangled banner not wave 
or the land of the free and the home of the brave. And then in the middle of verse 2, praise the power that hath made and preserved us a nation. Then conquer we must when our cause it is just. And this be our motto, in God is our trust. And the star-spangled banner in triumph shall wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. And then is America the Beautiful, first published in 1910. Half of the first uh, three verses I'm going to go through now. In verse 1, America, America, God shed his grace on thee. Who's the one who shed his grace? God did. And crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. Verse 2, America, America, God mend thine every floor. Confirm thy soul in liberty, thy liberty in law. Our liberties are from God, and they're in our laws. Our liberties are found in the Bill of Rights. And then in verse 3, America, America, my, may God thy gold refine, till all success be nobleness and every gain divine. And who is this God? Who is this God that we've been singing about? Let's look at the Battle Hymn of the Republic. In verse 4 it says, In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea, with a glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. As he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free, while God is marching on. Glory, glory, alleluia. What's that mean? Alleluia is praise the Lord. Glory, glory, alleluia, his truth is marching on. And where do you find his truth? You find it right here in the scriptures, in the Bible. And by the way, in verse 1 it says, His truth, that's Christ's truth, is marching on. Verse 2, His day is marching on. Verse 3, our God is marching on. And in verse 4, while God is marching on. You see, Christ is God. He's the one who transfigures us. He's the one who can change us from the inside and give us a new nature, a partaker of his own divine nature. He transfigures us, and it's his truth and his day that's marching on. Now, I want you to also note the title, Battle Hymn of the Republic. The United States of America is a republic. You see, a republic is a state in which the supreme power is held by the people and their elected representatives and which has an elected or nominated president rather than a monarch. Now, getting back to the question, why did they die? I mean, for what were they fighting? What was so valuable that it, that it paid for them to even sacrifice their own life? Well, the answer is our freedoms, our liberty, our inalienable rights, and you know what that means in alienable rights? It means incapable of being surrendered or transferred. And why are they inalienable? Well, I looked at uslegal.com and here's what I read. The Declaration of Independence speaks about unalienable rights. And by the way, unalienable and inalienable means the same thing. It says that all men were created equal, that they are endowed by their creator, with certain unalienable rights, with life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These rights cannot be bartered away, or given away, or taken away, except in punishment of crime. Governments are instituted to secure, not grant or create, these rights. The U.S. Constitution does not mention unalienable or natural rights, but the first ten amendments to the Constitution, they list the basic rights of Americans. And these amendments are known as the Bill of Rights. 
How many of you have looked at the Bill of Rights lately? I found it to be a great reminder how great it is to be living and a citizen in this great country of ours. This country which recognizes the inalienable rights of its citizens. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through them right now so that you can have a greater appreciation for those who died so that we could have these freedoms and enjoy these rights. So the First Amendment, the First Amendment provides several rights protections to express ideas through speech and the press, to assemble or gather with a group, to protest or for other reasons, and to ask the government to fix problems. It also protects the right to religious beliefs and practices. It prevents the government from creating or favoring a religion. Second Amendment protects the right to keep and bear arms. It's there to protect you from government overreach in trampling your rights. The Third Amendment prevents government from forcing homeowners to allow soldiers to use their homes. Before the Revolutionary War, law gave British soldiers the right to take over private homes. The Fourth Amendment bars the government from unreasonable search and seizure of the individual or their individual property, their private property. The Fifth Amendment provides for several protections for people accused of crimes. It states that serious criminal charges must be started by a grand jury. A person cannot be tried twice for the same offense, double jeopardy, or have property taken away without just compensation. People have the right against self-incrimination and cannot be imprisoned without due process of law. In other words, fair procedures and trials. Then there's the Sixth Amendment. Provides additional protections to people accused of crimes, such as the right to a speedy and public trial, trial by an impartial jury in criminal cases, and to be informed of criminal charges. Witnesses must face the accused, and the accused is allowed his or her own witnesses and to be represented by a lawyer. Seventh Amendment extends the right to a jury trial in federal civil cases. The Eighth Amendment bars excessive bail, fines, and cruel and unusual punishment. The Ninth Amendment states that listing specific rights in the Constitution does not mean that people don't have other rights that have not been spelled out. And the Tenth Amendment says that the federal government only has those powers delegated in the Constitution. If it isn't listed, it belongs to the states or to the people. Indeed, quite a list, quite a list to fight for and even to die for. Today, we honor those who gave their lives so that we could enjoy our freedoms and our rights. And now what I'd like to do is, we'd like to look at two very unique verses. I'd like to look at them for Memorial Day. And the verses are found in 1 Corinthians. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 29 and 30. Verse 29. Otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead if the dead do not rise at all? Why then are they baptized for the dead? And why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? Well, verse 29 is very difficult. But verse 30 speaks to the dangers that the Apostle Paul and the other apostles faced every hour of every day. They faced potential death and martyrdom. And so verse 29 may be asking, if there is no resurrection, then why would anyone put their life on the line in sharing the gospel of liberty, liberty from sin, replacing those missionaries who had died in ministry. And certainly, why would Paul and the other apostles put their life on the line? Those verses, they give us a valuable principle applicable to Memorial Day. And that is, people 
are willing to put their life on the line for something or someone they love or cherish. If you love and cherish someone or something, you're willing to put your life on the line. Why would men and women join the military and give their lives if it were not for our liberty? And that takes us to our first point. Our nation is in danger of losing our liberties, freedoms, and rights. Our nation is in danger of losing our liberties, freedoms, and rights. See, there's a liberal progressive movement in our country that desires to take away our liberties one by one. They believe that it's the elites, you know, those behind the movement, they know what's best for you. And um, they will supply your needs in exchange for your freedoms. The progressive agenda is being taught to your children. Revisionist history has been taught now for years. David Barton's Wall Builders website had the following article. The title of it was, Is America Turning into a Nation of Dunces? It was written April 17, 2019. Thomas Jefferson, in 1789, wrote, Whenever the people are well informed, they can be trusted with their own government. But if Jefferson were to read the results of the latest survey from Woodrow Wilson National Fellowship Foundation, he might seriously doubt modern Americans' capacity for self-governance. It shows that most Americans would fail even a basic citizenship test. Today, half of college graduates don't know how long the terms are for representatives or senators. Two out of five don't know that Congress has the power to declare war. Then it goes on. Indeed, pop culture's references are better known than the basics of American civics and history, even when those pop references are decades old. More Americans can name the three stooges than the three branches of government. And three times as many can identify the city with the zip code 90210, Beverly Hills from a TV show, than the city where our Constitution was written. Even the most rudimentary knowledge of that founding document eludes far too many Americans. Barely half, in fact 53%, for example, know that the first 10 Americans are called the Bill of Rights. Barely half know that truth. A third cannot name a single right protected by the First Amendment. And what many do know is wrong. For example, more than one in 10 Americans say that the Bill of Rights protects the right to own a pet. Only 35% know that the first three words of the Constitution are we the people. And then it goes on. We truly, uh, what's truly frightening is how this stunning unfamiliarity with the Constitution has bred contempt. If put to a vote today, only half of those surveyed said they would vote to adopt the Constitution. Even fewer believe that Congress should follow the Constitution. So much for the rule of law. And speaking of law, misunderstandings regarding the judicial branch are particularly acute. The Annenberg's Public po uh, Policy Center's annual surveys, for example, show that one in four Americans think a five to four Supreme Court ruling is sent to Congress. One in four also think that it might be better to do away with the court altogether, getting rid of the Supreme Court. George Washington said that the education of our youth in the science of government is vital because they are the future guardians of the liberties of the country. Yet, the National Center for States Courts found that only one in five U.S. adults can correctly name all three branches. And two and five couldn't name a single one. Samuel Adams wrote that the nation's freedom would be secure so long as virtue and knowledge are diffused among the people. Yet our national stock of both seems to be dwindling. Far too many Americans think that Judge Judy 
is a Supreme Court justice. Karl Marx is a founding author, an author of the uh, Constitution. And your great Aunt Lucy has a specifically defined constitutional right to keep those 26 cats. It's laughable until you realize that the civic illiteracy extends to the point that many are apparently perfectly fine with either ignoring the Constitution or throwing it out altogether. Jefferson said that a nation cannot expect to be both ignorant and free. For the sake of our nation and of our personal freedom, it is essential that we get back to teaching the basics of American civics. We are failing the founders. Do you hear that? Two in five adults couldn't name a single branch of government. I guess they were never taught also that the founding fathers came up with those three branches of government from the Bible verse, Isaiah chapter 33, verse 22. For the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. The Lord is our judge. That's the judicial branch. They came up with the judicial branch. The Lord is our lawgiver. That's Congress. Is our king. That's president. You see, because they understood the sinfulness of man, they knew that all that power should not be in the hands of a single person. And hence, the three branches of government, judicial branch, Congress, and president. James Madison said if men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. In other words, if angels ran the government, you wouldn't need restrictions that the Constitution places on government. That statement shows they understood the sinfulness of man. But unfortunately, the problem today is many don't believe that. Another thing, the Founding Fathers warned us of losing our, con our freedoms, of losing our freedoms. Noah Webster, he said, in my view, the Christian religion is the most important and one of the first things all children under free government are to be instructed. He goes on, no truth is more evident to my mind than that the Christian religion must be the basis of any government intended to secure the rights and privileges of a free people. In other words, if you want to be a free people, then Christian principles are the basis for that government. John Adams said, Statesman, my dear sir, may plan and speculate for liberty, but it is religion and morality alone which can establish principles upon which freedom can securely stand. Benjamin Rush, the only foundation for a republic is to be laid in religion. Without this, there can be no virtue, and without virtue, there can be no liberty. And liberty is the object and life of all republican governments. Benjamin Rush, one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, in contemplating the political institutions of the United States, I lament that we waste so much time and money punishing crimes and takes so little pains to prevent them. We profess to be Republicans, and yet we neglect the only means of establishing and perpetuating our Republican forms of government. That is, universal education of our youth in the principles of Christianity by means of the Bible. I want you to note something. When they talk about Republicans, not talking about the Republican Party, that didn't even start until Abraham Lincoln. Republicans here means we're a republic. Our country is a republic. It's not a democracy, it's a republic. That is, our laws are founded on biblical absolutes. The law overrides the majority or the minority. It's law, and it's a law based on the Judeo-Christian ethic. Northwestern, Northwest Ordinance, Requirements for Becoming a State, Article 3, states religion, morality, and knowledge being necessary to good government and to the happiness of mankind. 
schools and the means of education shall forever be encouraged. George Washington's farewell address, seven, um, September 17, 1796. Of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. In vain would, would that man claim the tribute of patriotism who should labor to subvert these great pillars of human happiness, these sternest props of the duties of men and citizens. Now, I want you to remember something. Religion here, in the mind of uh, George Washington, is Christianity. When they speak about religion, they're talking about here Christianity. And therefore, George Washington believed Christianity and morality are the pillars of human happiness. Christianity and morality are the dispositions that lead to political prosperity. No patriot would work to subvert Christianity. Again, George Washington's farewell address. And let us with caution indulge the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion. Again, without Christianity. Reason and experience bo both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principle. Charles Carroll, signer of the Declaration of Independence, said, Without morals, the Republic cannot subsist any length of time. They, therefore, who are decrying the Christian religion are undermining the solid foundation of morals, the best security for the duration of free governments. Samuel Adams, religion and good morals are the only solid foundation of public liberty and happiness. Where do you find public liberty and happiness? Religion and good morals, he said, as the only solid foundation. And then there's Patrick Henry. The great pillars of all government and of social life are virtue, morality, and religion. This is the armor and this alone that renders us invincible. Now, do you think that the Founding Fathers would consider church as non-essential? Question. Is the Bible being taught to our children in our public schools? So that as Samuel Adams stated, they'll have religion and good morals, the only solid foundation of public uh, liberty and happiness. Well, if you think that's a strange question, let me tell you what the NEA, um, National Education Association, in 1892 said. It said, if the study of the Bible is excluded from all state schools, if the inculcation of the principles of Christianity is to have no place in the daily program, if the worship of God is to form no part of the general exercises of these public elementary schools, then the good of the state would be better served by restoring all schools to church control. Harvard's Rule and Precepts, Harvard University, 1636, let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well the main end of his life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life. That's John 17, verse 3. And therefore lay Christ at the bottom as the only foundation of all sound knowledge and learning. So what changed? What changed? John Dewey came on the scene, the architect of modern education. Here's what he said. Faith in the prayer hearing God is an unproved and outmoded faith. There is no God and there is no soul. Hence, there are no needs for the props of traditional religion with dogma and creed excluded. The immutable truth is also dead and buried. There is no room for fixed natural law or moral absolutes. And by the way, John Dewey was the signer of the Humanist Manifesto. The Humanist Manifesto is the title of, of three manifestos laying out the humanist worldview. And the first manifesto, signed by Dewey, talked of the new religion and referred to humanism as a religious movement 
to transcend and replace previous religions that were based on allegations of supernatural revelation. He's the architect of modern education. Second point today, how serious, how serious are we about our liberty, freedoms, and rights? How serious are we? What did Patrick Henry say? Give me liberty or give me death. Or was it, give me liberty or give me death except in COVID-19? Think about this. In World War II, U.S. military deaths was 416,800. How many would we have been willing to lose to keep our liberty? Listen, we lose our liberty when we do nothing about keeping them. We lose our freedoms when we do nothing about keeping them. Government cannot tell people they can't go to church. That violates the First Amendment to our Constitution. Government can recommend you not go to church for some reason, for some time, but government has no authority to tell you or me you can't go to church. In fact, God is the one who instituted government, and no government has the authority to tell you to do something that God does not permit. Romans 13 once tells us there is no authority except from God. It also appears that the liberal, progressive, anti-God movement is attempting to use this current pandemic to bring in socialism. I want you to think about it. The more that businesses are closed down then, and the government prints money, you know, money out of thin air, and then gives it to the people, then the more the people become dependent on government. And then government begins to run everything and makes the decisions for you. That's socialism and the loss of true freedom, your freedoms. Just look at the states that have, still have the businesses closed and their heavy-handed tactics to keep them closed so that they can't make a living, which forces them to do what? To depend on government. Most of these states are run by democratic, progressive governors. And so, the question is, how serious are we about our liberty, freedoms, and rights? Third point, is there hope? Is there hope for our country? Well, the ultimate answer is yes. Our only true hope is God. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14 says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Our nation needs to repent, needs to turn back to God. And our founding fathers understood that. Daniel Webster said, to preserve the government, we must also preserve morals. Morality rests on religion. If you destroy the foundation, the superstructure must fall. When the public mind becomes vitiated or polluted and corrupt, laws are nullity and constitutions are a waste paper. So what can we do about it now? Well, first of all, pray. Pray for our leaders. Wisdom to, to do what's right and upholding our Constitution and the Bill of Rights. And secondly, stand for truth. Take to heart what I've, I've shared here in this message and, and share it with others so that they understand the foundations of our nation and they know their rights. And thirdly, Write letters, make phone calls, you know, let the president, the governor, and congressmen know where you stand. Uh, and, and if you protest, do it in a God-honoring way. And fourthly, vote for leaders. Vote for leaders who support the Constitution 
and the principles set forth by our founding fathers. Remember, this coming November is election day. You know, Noah Webster said the following. He said, when you become entitled to exercise the right of voting for public officers, let it be impressed on your mind that God commands you to choose for rulers just men who will rule in the fear of God. The preservation of our government depends on the faithful discharge of this duty. If the citizens neglect their duty and place unprincipled men in office, the government will soon be corrupted. Laws will be made not for the public good so much as for selfish or local purposes. Corrupt or incompetent men will appoint to be appointed to execute the laws. The public revenues will be squandered on unworthy men and the rights of the citizen will be violated or disregarded. If our government fails to secure public prosperity and happiness, it must be because the citizens neglected the divine commands and elected bad men to make and administer their laws. Proverbs 29 verse 2 puts it this way. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when a wicked man rules, the people groan. Our country needs godly people in leadership. In regard to that, I found the following article on David Barton's website. It said, Trump White House opens door to Christian conservative colleges. It said, conservative and Christian colleges and universities are landing more interns inside the Trump White House and administration after an eight-year dry spell during the Obama era. Schools such as Liberty University, Patrick Henry College, and Hillsdale College have seen a significant increase in students winning internships in the Republican administration as well as on Capitol Hill and the U.S. Supreme Court. And it follows a surge in their graduates getting jobs in Washington. During the Obama years, for example, Liberty landed two interns in the White House. Under Trump, they've already placed 11. Today's message, it was to honor those who have died while serving our country in military service. They gave the ultimate sacrifice for our freedom. Today, we also remember Jesus Christ, who gave his life that we could be free from the tyranny of sin. I have a question. Do you honor the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you recognize him for what he did for you? He died for your sins, all your sins, past, present, and future. He died so that you could have eternal life. And that eternal life is a gift. He offers it as a gift to be received. If you'll trust him, if you'll put your faith in him, believing he died for you, believing he rose from the dead and he's offering you that life, and you say, Lord, yes, I want it. Give me that righteousness I need in order to get to heaven. And he promises to do that. And once you receive that gift, you will see him beginning to change your life. And he promises that one day you'll be with him forever in eternity. It's all a gift, and he did it all. He's the one who transfigures you and me. And so, may their sacrifice not be in vain. The sacrifice of those who died to protect our freedoms, as well as the sacrifice of him who died to free us from sin. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for the freedoms that we enjoy in our country. Thank you for the wisdom you gave to our founding fathers as they recognized you as the one true God and your word, the Bible, as the foundation of truth. And Lord, thank you for the men and women who gave their lives that we could have the freedoms we enjoy. Lord, we pray that you would work in the hearts of our leaders. For those who, who govern and legislate against your principles, we pray that you would work in their hearts. And if they will not repent, that you would remove them from office. And Lord, we pray that people of all religions would enjoy freedom of religion. We're all are free to express their religious views in the marketplace in our day-to-day -day lives. Lord, we pray 
that those who died for our freedoms would not have died in vain. And it's in Christ's name that we pray this. Amen.